Since 1993, the Alzheimer's Research and Prevention Foundation has been dedicated to preventing Alzheimer's disease by funding research studies and educational programs on a brain-healthy lifestyle. As a nonprofit organization, our research and educational outreach activities are made possible by the generosity of private donors. It is our vision that the Four Pillars of Prevention program can reduce the risk of developing Alzheimer's disease, and everyone can enjoy a lifetime of peak mental performance. To learn more, please visit our website at www.alzheimersprevention.org. For ongoing updates, you can also subscribe to our YouTube channel. So official welcome to everybody um, to our November 13, 2014 teleseminar entitled A Leading Holistic Physicians Program for Healthy Aging and a Sharp Memory. And our guest speaker is Dr. Karen Koffler. Um, today we're very happy to have um, our ARPF founder, pres president and medical director, Dr. Dharma Singh Khalsa, um, here with us today. And he's the pioneer in the field of stress, meditation, and memory. And he's the one who spearheaded the ARPF Innovative Research Initiative at important medical schools around the country and the world. And he will be introducing Dr. Koffler. So, Dr. Khalsa? Thank you, Kirti, and good evening, everyone. I hope you're feeling relaxed and serene. And to just to get us all on the same page, on the same wavelength, I thought we'd do something very simple. Just take a few nice, long, slow, deep breaths through the nose. And nothing, no big deal. We'll just start by, because it's been a hectic day, you know, and it's a hectic time right now. So let's just all kind of relax and begin by letting our eyes close for a moment and sitting comfortably, fine, straight. And take a nice, long, slow, deep breath through your nose, please. And once you come to your apex, hold the breath. And now, slowly exhale through your nose only, not the mouth, just the nose. Slowly. Good, and let's do that again. Inhale deep through the nose, a little more forcefully. Hold the breath. Put your tongue up on the upper palate behind that ridge in the front teeth. Press in there to stimulate the hypothalamus. Inhale a little more. Now hold the breath. And slowly relax this breath down. Nice. Now, one more time. Let's inhale deep. Deeper. Hold the breath. Tongue on the roof of the mouth. Squeeze your belly button in to touch your spine and kind of just look up inside your head. Roll your eyes up slightly. Inhale more. Hold the breath. Yeah. Now slowly exhale. Yeah, that was good. Exhale deep through the nose. Inhale deep. Exhale and relax. And that was good. So thank you very much, Kirti. And I, too, would like to acknowledge our supporters for their donations. You know, what we're seeing right now here in the Alzheimer's Research and Prevention Foundation is a bit of a resurgence or a renaissance. You know, things have their own natural waves about them and we're on an uptick in our in our uh, understanding in our appreciation and in, in people recognizing the work that we're doing 
In fact, a book just came out. It's an academic text. It's not really a book for the average layperson, but it's interesting nonetheless. It's called Resilience and Aging, Research and Practice by Professor Helen Lavretsky from UCLA. And the reason I'm mentioning that is because our research is in this book. And also beyond that, I'd like to say that there's a chapter dedicated to the greatest emerging trend in research right now, which is psycho-spiritual well-being, or psychological well-being and spiritual well-being, which I call spiritual fitness. And uh, if you want to learn more about our research, and for example, you can download the white paper that I've written, you go to our website, www.alzheimersprevention.org slash research, and you can find all the papers from our research, general description for the layperson, scientific description, the whole thing, and also this white paper. Uh, if you'd like to have a hard copy of the white paper, we can also get that out. You can just email info at alzheimersprevention.org, and we'd happy be happy to do that. So I just wanted to mention that because if you're so inclined, this is the end of the year, and, you know, these deductions are tax deduct deductible, we'd be very grateful for some help because we're going onward and upward, and every dime, every dollar, every penny of your donations goes towards programs, uh, research and education, and so on and so forth. So we just, uh, we really uh, are looking forward to going up to the next level and we'd really appreciate your help with that. So you can also donate at the website, alzheimersprevention.org. There's a spot there to donate. And if you'd like, you can also download the meditation, Kirtan Kriya, that we do study, very inexpensive download. And you can get that and do the meditation every day. We can have a global ARPF meditation community, and it would be great. So having said that, I'd like to now introduce our speaker for this evening, the excellent and wonderful physician, Dr. Karen Koffler, who I know personally. Uh, I've been to Canyon Ranch in Miami Beach a number of times where she is the medical director, and she does an excellent job there. She's a great doctor. She's one of the first people to study in the integrative medicine program with Dr. Andrew Weil. And uh, like I said, she's very knowledgeable and does an excellent job. So what I'm going to do is actually read the first question to Karen, and then she will take it from there. And then uh, she'll probably want to talk a little bit, and then we have other questions. I'll pass the phone back to Kirti. Kirti will moderate and read the questions after Karen finishes her discussion. So here we go. Are you ready, Dr. Koffler? I sure am, and thank you. You're welcome. The first question is, uh, what are the three most important lifestyle steps a person can take to ensure healthy aging, and especially in regards to memory? So without further ado, here's Dr. Koffler. Thanks, Dharma. Um, so you sort of set me up by mentioning the uh, spiritual fitness part, so I'll save that for the end so it sounds like I came up with that by myself. Um, I, I think um, really probably the single most important thing that I see in patients across the board is making a very big difference in how they feel, really regardless of their age, is first and foremost diet. And I know we'll be talking more about that as the evening goes on, but basically a diet that's largely plant-based um, is the one that we at Canyon Ranch end up putting most of our patients on. Um, foods that we identify are particularly inflammatory, we remove uh, very frequently. You know, when we actually test for that, we see those foods include frequently wheat, dairy, uh, eggs, corn, uh, yeast are some of the most common ones. And by no means do I think everybody has to be off those foods. But if people are suffering from inflammatory uh, conditions, those are very often culprits in that. Um, and, uh, and tasty, you know, food should be great. It should be delicious. We don't uh, put people on rigid diets because nobody, nobody remains on a rigid diet. 
Um, we're, we're trying to help people learn how to enjoy good, healthy food that's, as I mentioned, largely plant-based. So that would be obviously fruits and vegetables, but also nuts and seeds and, and whole grains. I don't, I don't uh, completely agree with Dr. Perlmutter, who I, I think we'll be talking more about him as we go on in the questions, but I do think that um, uh, grains can be very helpful. Um, so that's first and foremost is diet. Uh, supplements would fall fall under the diet. Um, I don't actually believe that supplements buy great health, but I think they can certainly augment what we do if they're tailored. Uh, secondly, without a doubt, is movement. Uh, we rust, as do door hinges and bicycles and everything else if we don't move. And so uh, there's got to be movement in everybody's lives every day. Uh, we've got to focus on that more as we age because we we are so inclined to be so much more sedentary. Around our department, we have a favorite saying, and that is, sitting is the new smoking. Um, and probably we're all sitting at the moment, but hopefully it will we'll stand up throughout our talk, as I'm doing now, to stretch out a little bit. Uh, so movement is critical. And um, and I'm happy to answer questions about that as we go on. Um, and then if I was forced into a third category, I would say uh, practices that uh, allow us to uh, modulate stress and connect to a deeper, more enduring part of ourselves. Because from that uh, from that whole field of practice, uh, it is much easier to make good lifestyle choices on a day-to-day -day basis. When you're more connected with what you need and how you feel, making healthy choices with regards to food, making sure that you get your walk in or do some yoga or you slow down your breathing, uh, all become a very natural uh, outcropping of a regular practice that connects you with something that is above and beyond the trivial and not so trivial concerns of a day. So those are my three categories and I think your spiritual fitness probably fits squarely into the latter category, Dharma. That's fantastic. Um, thank you so much. I think this was already about maybe five minutes or so of Dr. Koffler's wisdom, and it was already fantastic, so off the charts. Uh, Thank you. Thank um, I, think, I think it's great for all of us to hear this, you know, coming from a physician, because, you know, a lot of people sort of, you know, take their own, which they should, take their health into their own hands. Um, you know, we want people to be responsible and and really be proactive. But this is not typically a conversation that we're have, we have with our doctor. So um, this is wonderful. All right. I, I'll move on to the, the next question uh, that came from Ralph. Um, and I'll just read it. Um, Alzheimer's runs in my family. I am 52 years old. My father's mother didn't get it until late, her late 60s or early 70s, and she saw people who weren't there and could walk through her walls. And eventually, uh, within five years or so, ended up in a home and dying maybe three years later. Her husband, my grandfather, got Alzheimer's in his early 60s, but had it for about 15 years before he died. My mother started showing signs in her 60s, just repeating things excessively, tell me a story, and within 10, 20 minutes repeating it again. Um, and she gradually got worse until she didn't recognize herself in a mirror and died in her late uh, 70s. And then he says, I already struggle sometimes with short-term memory and worry that I've got early-onset Alzheimer's. When should I be checked to see and become proactive to stop it? So this is the question. Great question. So um, so it looks like there's some um, strong family history of some sort of dementia, but we actually don't know 
that it is Alzheimer's type, remember that there's several different kinds of dementia. Um, probably the second most common one would be vascular dementia. Certainly Alzheimer's uh, is the lead there, but, but vascular type dementia, Parkinson's dementia are, are other forms. Um, so first, you know, uh, understanding that there may be a mix of different kinds of dementias in Ralph's history. Um, you know, I, I think uh, we all become aware as we age of the things that we forget and we become very concerned that uh, this could be evidence of something more significant. Um, you know, one thing to remember or, or some things to remember when we're considering, when we're concerned about the development of dementia are some of the warning signs of dementia. And they go beyond memory loss to include things like difficulty performing usual tasks like turning on the microwave oven, um, uh, balancing a checkbook, uh, disorientation to time and place um, uh, or, or location, you know, parking. And, and these are new changes, by the way. So my mom would never necessarily remember where she parked if she didn't make a mental note of it. But if someone typically is quite good at that and suddenly they notice that they don't recall where the car is or they're driving and they feel disoriented, um, that would be something that would be, uh, you would want to follow up on. Judgment, uh, you know, decisions that reflect a change in judgment or character uh, is an important uh, warning sign. Um, I think everybody misplaces things, but uh, if you are noticing an increased pattern, especially if this is something new for you, I misplace things constantly. My husband rarely does. It would be more worrisome for him than it would be for me. Uh, and then a couple of things that are really important are changes in mood and, and changes in, behavior, in uh, personality. So, so those are more significant probably than just beginning to forget uh, certain details. Um, researchers think we do that, we do begin to forget some things because there's more that we have in our brains. And so accessing information can become more circuitous as we retrieve it. But once we retrieve that information, we often have a richer connection of memory associated with that. Um, so getting back to uh, Ralph's question as to um, as to what he should do proactively and whether or not he should be checked. Um, you know, checking for dementia involves a, a few things. There are some simple um, survey questions that I, even a primary care doc knows to, to ask of a patient, and that's actually been updated recently. Um, there is a gene that some doctors offer. I don't happen to offer this, but there is an ApoE4 gene that uh, tends to be more frequently found in patients who do develop dementia. I don't run that gene because I think it hexes people. Uh, people who do have that gene don't necessarily go on to develop dementia. A substantial number of people never do. But in people who have dementia, a higher percentage are more likely to have an ApoE4 gene. Um, and, and proactively stopping it, you know, the good news about protecting oneself from dementia uh, is if you follow lifestyle habits that protect you from dementia, you're also protecting yourself from heart disease, diabetes, stroke, uh, arthritis, and lots of other diseases. So, you know, it's the same pillars that, uh, that, um, that I talked about earlier and that the Alzheimer's Research and Prevention Foundation talk about, and that is, uh, you know, diet, 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 you know, cleaning up your diet, getting rid of the, rid of the sugar and inflammatory foods, um, you know, uh, not making alcohol a huge part of your 
uh, regular intake, although it, I, don't, I don't feel that there's evidence to support that people shouldn't drink at all in an effort to protect themselves from Alzheimer's. Um, and secondarily, staying very active. Um, and along with that is mental activity. So, you know, people who become expansive as they age, as opposed to contracted, both physically and mentally, do a lot better. And so uh, learning something entirely new uh, shows, that, uh, studies show that the brain uh, becomes much more active, for instance, if we are learning a new language and that it, people who are bilingual or trilingual actually uh, light up their brain quite a bit more do, in, in routine conversation. So learning a new language, learning the language of, an, of, a, of a musical instrument, learning to dance, learning new things that are novel for you um, would be an excellent way to be proactive. And then as I mentioned before, you know, one of the advantages to something like meditation is that it, it relaxes the brain. And I frankly think we need much more of that in our culture. Our brains are on and in high gear, and it wouldn't surprise me if that doesn't exhaust the function of the neurons. So, you know, having an intentional practice that allows you to quiet your brain down without actually being asleep, I think, is an essential other ingredient. Wow, this is um, important. Um, I know Dr. Kalsa has a comment. I just wanted to add uh, one thing to that very thorough discussion. Recent research has revealed that anxiety, people who feel anxious, have a higher incidence of memory problems. And beyond that, the drugs that are quite often used to treat anxiety are now shown to uh, turn on the many, uh, turn on genes that are associated with the development of Alzheimer's disease. And tagged into that is sleep. So the idea of having insomnia from anxiety and then having to take sleeping pills like Valium or Ambien, things like that, really mess up your memory. And so sleep hygiene is critically important. So how you can get a good night's sleep, I think that's one of the number one things that you know we have to do as we get older because uh, 60, something like 60% of Americans don't sleep well. And it's interesting that 60% also, I think, have diabetes and there's a high incidence of heart disease and, and dementia. So I think sleep is critically important and how you develop your own sleep habits, uh, I think, uh, go a long way towards helping your brain stay healthy. So just wanted That's to add that one little point. thing. That's an excellent point. You know, what, we, what I see so much of in the patients that I see, regardless of what diagnoses they're presenting um, with, is that the, uh, you know, underneath it all is the lack of a strategy for managing stress, and that leads over very frequently into our ability to succumb to sleep. You know, as I'm saying this, I'm looking down at my 95-pound yellow lab who apparently has absolutely no problems falling asleep. And in fact, as humans, we're the only species on the planet Earth that actually has difficulty with sleep, one of the most basic fundamental uh, habits of all living creatures is the ability to rest. We're the exception to that. So I agree with you, Dharma. Great point. Yeah, well, um, in fact, we have a question about sleep. I, I think that may, this might be a good lead into that question, which is I sleep from five, uh, this is Phyllis was asking, I sleep from 5 p.m. until 1 a.m., because my time clock seems to have turned around. Is that sleep still beneficial, or is it bad because it's not during the night? And then as a follow-up, um, should I ask them all, should I read them all now? The, the follow-up question is, what about people who sleep, three, who sleep three to four hours, then are up for a couple of hours, and then sleep again for another couple of hours? Is, this uh, related to aging? In other words, is, is there a, a problem because of the aging process? 
Well, um, okay. So the the clock that that has been shifted to be earlier, um, you know, I I would still um, say that probably one of the most important markers of whether or not that's good quality sleep is simply how this person feels. So, you know, Phyllis, if you're on, I mean, my my question to you, if you were sitting in front of me, because that looks like seven hours of sleep, and sleep researchers generally feel that we need seven to nine hours as adults. Kids need more like nine to 12. So if you're sleeping soundly from 5 p.m. to 1 a.m., I think probably one of the biggest risks is how you're going to engage the rest of the world uh, being up at 1 o'clock in the morning and being asleep already at 5 p.m. Um, but if it's solid sleep, in other words, if it's restorative sleep and you feel well-rested when you wake up and you can conduct your activities of daily living, then that is, that is uh, the sine qua non of, of beneficial sleep. Um, you know, if you wanted to get more in sync with the rest of the world, I would slowly try to edge that more, uh, so, more uh, so that you're shifting it more towards the later hours of the evening. So, you know, instead of going to bed at 5 p.m., make it 5.30. If you have to do it in smaller increments, you could. And see if you can't slowly shift it a little bit more. But again, if you feel well-rested, then my answer is, you know, it doesn't necessarily suit what everybody else is doing, but it seems as if it might uh, be adequate for you. Um, a sleep study could confirm that. So, you know, if you were inclined, you could get a sleep study, and that would document whether or not that that you achieved restorative stages of sleep or deep sleep. Um, People who sleep three to four hours and then are up for a few hours and then sleep again for a couple of hours, well, first of all, they're fortunate that they can go back to sleep for a couple of hours because so many of my patients will do the first half of that. In other words, they'll sleep for the first few hours and then they'll be up and they won't be able to fall back to sleep. You know, it most often is due to a very, very busy mind uh, you know, that just harkens back to what we were talking about before, about being able to succumb to sleep because you're relaxed enough. We always want to make sure when I'm talking with patients who have similar symptoms, I want to be sure that they're not taking in too many fluids in the evening and having to urinate during the night, which causes enough disruption for them to then be awake. So we have different strategies for for helping people uh, change that. Um, but one simple thing is is just don't take in any additional fluids about two hours before going to bed, um, and that, that can address that. Um, for those folks who only sleep about three to four hours, we know that there are higher markers of inflammation in people who are, who are routinely sleeping less than five hours a night. So that would be a major concern because dementia and many other diseases that we see in adults, heart disease, diabetes, et cetera, all have in common uh, inflammation. So if we're seeing higher inflammatory markers just by inadequate sleep, I'd be concerned that we were stimulating or, or encouraging um, uh, the progression of other health issues. So mm. those folks need to learn sleep hygiene and and need to get at the root of why they're waking up. Um, like I said, most often it's a busy mind, so learning how to quiet your thoughts. Um, in my experience, the most powerful thing is really meditation. Um, but I do want to say one other thing to normalize something. Part of the time, many of my patients will get anxious uh, because they're thinking, oh, gosh, here I go again. I'm not going to be able to sleep. Then I won't be able to work. I'll feel awful. And they drive this uh, worry and fear and anxiety that, that puts themselves into a state uh, that doesn't allow sleep to reenter. So for those folks, I, I remind them that historically, we probably all went to sleep when it got dark. There is mm -hmm. evidence in old literature to suggest that we probably all woke up around midnight, 1 a.m., and then went back to sleep 
a few hours later and slept slept until the sun came up. We were much more in sync with the rhythm of nature, and so we slept more in the winter than we did in the summer. But it, it, looking at old, old literature, they refer to first, first sleep, second sleep, suggesting that we slept for several hours, woke up, were up, were up for a little while, and went back to sleep. Now, when it wasn't so safe at night for us uh, back in ancient times, it probably behooved us to wake up during the night, sort of survey the landscape and make sure there was no immediate threats, and then fall back to sleep. So, you know, I just want to normalize a little bit for, for folks who might be experiencing this, that it's not unusual for people to wake up during the night. That's not necessarily considered to be abnormal by sleep researchers. If you're up for a few hours, then yes, there seems to be a problem with you being able to quiet yourself enough to fall back to sleep. But waking up in and of itself is not a problem. Um, we do seem to need less sleep or we do seem to get less sleep as we age. Um, again, I still would submit that we need a minimum of seven hours ideally in order to keep our brain healthy and keep very, our energy high. Yeah, yeah, very interesting, um, very interesting point. I noticed myself that when um, about a month ago or so when the days started really yeah. getting shorter, I by 6 o'clock it was, you know, pitch dark, and by 7 o'clock I was, yawning and yawning and saying, I have to go to sleep. And then I'd look at my watch and say, wow, it's only 7 o'clock, 6.30 p.m. Right. or 7 p.m. And, you know, and it was it was very interesting. And I don't feel that way anymore. I feel, you know, more awake, um, even though it's dark and um, I'm back into my normal routine. But um, I noticed that change. Um, so, yeah, that's absolutely true. So yeah. I, I wanted to ask a question from Myrtle. Um, dear Dr. Koffler, my sister has been diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease in 2010. I am constantly looking for anything natural that can help her from slipping away completely, but recently I seem to be losing her. And then the question is, is there any truth in reports that state Alzheimer's disease can be reversed? And then she says, thank you for all that the foundation is doing to help these patients and their caregivers. Oh, that's, that's a nice comment. Listen, I, you know, I don't know about Alzheimer's disease being reversed. I, I have not personally had that experience. Having said that, um, you, you know, we're taught as doctors never give false hope, but I... You know, the more I learn about the human body, the more I'm amazed by what it can do. So I, my organization is to generally think that anything is possible. Having said that, I personally have not had a patient with Alzheimer's uh, experience reversal, so I wouldn't focus my attention so much on that as I, as I do, obviously, in my practice prevention, but also optimizing function no matter where somebody is and no matter what they've got as a diagnosis. So um, with respect to uh, Myrtle's sister, I would say um, there's a lot natural. I've already spoken quite a bit. Uh, you know, the brain likes to be stimulated. So if your sister's suffering, for instance, from decreased hearing, having her wear hearing aids can actually have a big impact. In fact, we see dementia worsening as someone's hearing worsens because they're not able to receive important stimulation from, a wor from the world around them. And, and you'll notice people with hearing issues tend to sort of withdraw socially because it's so much work for them to try to be part of a conversation. So that, need, that kind of thing is easily addressed. Uh, you know, a simple thing is make sure her vitamin D3 level is optimized. And optimized to me means at least a level of 50, even though the labs show that anywhere between 30 and 100 is fine. Um, there's increasing data to suggest that we should be shooting for higher levels of vitamin D3. And notoriously, our elders do not get enough sunshine and even if they do get enough sunshine, many of us lose our capacity to synthesize vitamin D3 in our skin. So supplementing makes great sense. I would also want to make sure that there's nothing reversible going on in her. 
like thyroid disease or low B12 or things like that that are easily correctable. Um, so I'd want to make sure her nutrition is optimized. I'd want her actively engaged in things, listening to music, um, exposed to novel, exposure to novel uh, experiences, theater, uh, things like that, and movement, as we said before. Um, you know, some people might think in terms of supplements. I don't think um, that, like I, as I mentioned before, I think supplements can supplement uh, a largely healthy diet. Um, having said that, uh, there are some things that can make a difference. I think omega-3 fish oil can make a significant difference. I think turmeric can. Um, there's some evidence to support antioxidants, uh, particularly vitamin C and E can certainly reduce the rates of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, you know, I, I have colleagues and I've used before things like CoQ10 and resveratrol. Um, there's some data to support things like ginkgo biloba. So there's a number of supplements that are, are you know, potentially useful. Uh, but my experience is that lifestyle makes the biggest difference. That's, that's a great point. And we have a comment from Dr. Kalsa. Yeah, first of all, I agree with everything that Dr. Koffler said. Uh, and my, actually, the way I look at it, it's a two-sided coin is in that, you know, once a person has Alzheimer's disease and it's a progressive illness, and, of course, drugs do nothing, really, that it's hard to to reverse it. Uh, having said that, clinically, in my own experience, I have seen by using this program that we're talking about, the four pillars, that we can slow the progression of the illness. And of course, the further along the person is when they start the program, the harder it is to slow the progression. Now, let's just erase everything I just said, because uh, a new study, a very small study, came out from UCLA the neurology department that show that utilizing an integrative approach like we've been talking about, everything from diet and exercise and yoga, meditation, some supplements, the ones that Dr. Koffler mentioned, uh, they did show an improvement in memory in what's called the subjective cognitive decline, mild cognitive impairment, both of which can go on to Alzheimer's, as well as early Alzheimer's. So I think things uh, are progressing, and in the future... Uh, especially since the search for a magic bullet drug to reverse Alzheimer's has been elusive and may continue to be elusive, uh, that what we'll find is, is work like, for example, the finger study from Finland, which we support, has shown that an integrative program can change the cognitive ability of an elderly person. They haven't really tested it in, in people with Alzheimer's, but I think in the future we'll see that not everybody but some patients, because most patients with all people with Alzheimer's do not get on an integrated program because their neurologist gives them a drug and that's about it. But I think what we'll see in the future is that by uh, undertaking an integrative program such as we're discussing, you will see more and more uh, individuals with various stages of Alzheimer's be able to at least slow the progression, if not reverse it. That's a great point, and I, I, I have to say I have seen significant slowing in patients with Parkinson's. Um, so I think I, I agree with you. I think it's and certainly the earlier we get people, the bigger the impact we can have. That's exactly right. That's exactly right, yes. Um, okay, moving along, we have a question from Marianne. She says, I am interested in hearing what Dr. Koffler suggests as a diet to prevent or slow the progress of dementia. I have run across quite a bit of varied and conflicting information. For example, vegan with no added oils is best for cardiovascular system. Green brain advice from Dr. Permutter. Um, there is a Mediterranean diet. Chocolate is good. Uh, the green tea. Um, so she says, is there really scientific evidence out there to support eating or avoiding certain foods? And are there supplements that are recommended or discouraged? If recommended, in what doses? So I, I believe you already addressed the supplement uh, part. To what would you like to speak to who, um, the diet 
component. Sure, which Marianne, it can be absolutely. Com- com- it can be confusing. We yes, we understand it that. It can yeah. be. It can be completely confusing, and uh, you know that's that's the uh, sort of uh, crazy nature of what um, <laughs> what medicine is about. It evolves, um, and each day, if not. Certainly, each week, if not each day, we get new information that changes uh, what we potentially suggest to patients. So, you know, when I look at the balance of it, I mean, really, one of the best ways we can figure out what we should be doing is by studying the healthiest people on the planet. So, I think that was uh, something that was well done in the book called Blue Zones, which was written by a group of National Geographic scientists who did just that. They have been traveling around the world, and there's a website that you can also log on to, looking at the healthiest societies in the world and trying to understand what do they do that keeps them strong and robust into their hundreds. And they all share very similar things. They eat a clean diet. They eat a diet that they can recognize. There's no packaged food in their diet. They move, and these, this is where I derive my recommendations from, simply looking at epidemiologically at what people are doing and, and have been successful at. And they have strong social support. Elders in these other places, which include Sardinia and, uh, and the island of Okinawa in Japan, um, the Nicoya Peninsula of Costa Rica, uh, the Seventh-day Adventists in Loma Linda, California, and there's other groups that they've identified, uh, they all, one, one significant thing is their elders are all integral parts of the community. They're seen as the go-to people for insight, for wisdom, for teachings, uh, for conflict resolution. You know, so it's, it's a different kind of culture that they're living in, really from all those standpoints. But they're the ones who are racking up the successes. So... I, do I think that you need to eat a specific diet, and if you eat that diet, you're going to do well and, and avoid dementia? I, I can't say that. We have never shown that. I think fat is important for the brain. The brain is the, the vast majority of the brain is encased in fat, and low-fat diets do not help anyone. So I don't actually agree with um, Esselstyn and, and uh, Colin uh, T. Colin Campbell on on that. I I eat a fair amount of fat um, that I get through primarily nuts and seeds. Uh, and I think the other nutritional benefits in nuts and seeds are, are very important, certainly selenium, the fiber that we get, the protein that's there, and so forth. Uh, vitamin E, as I mentioned before, is a great antioxidant, are rich in nuts and seeds. Um, uh, with regard to the question about grain brain and, and Dr. Perlmutter, we are seeing that um, wheat is creating a problem for a lot of people and that when we remove wheat from the diet, a lot of inflammatory symptoms improve. And so increasingly, um, we are, are testing people for wheat sensitivity, which is different from celiac disease. Uh, which is also very significant and an important disease to identify. Um, but many more people have a gluten or gliadin sensitivity uh, that we can pick up through, through food sensitivity testing or through simply eliminating all wheat, which is no small feat. Wheat is in many, many, many products that you would never even dream of, including mascara, but certainly wow. eliminating the I know, it's crazy, but eliminating the food sources of, um, of wheat and seeing what, what people notice. Inevitably, things like eczema and uh, arthritis and bloating and migraines and post-nasal drip, and in my case, an, a, a vocal cord polyp, all can improve just by that simple maneuver. Um, so... I think it's worth looking into for yourself. You know, a lot of these diets you end up personalizing because you may not tolerate certain things. I think beans are fantastic. I had a bowl of lentil soup tonight for dinner, but not everybody can digest beans. And so whether or not it's good for you, 
if you can't digest it and you become inflamed by eating it, that can't be in your diet. Um, so I don't think there's a perfect diet, and I do think our diet should be you know, largely plant-based with clean and lean sources of protein to augment. Well, thank you. Um, sure. And then she had asked about the supplements again. Um, you know, most supplements are, um, you know, in my experience, I've, I took care, I've taken care of a lot more people who've had significant side effects from drugs than I've ever taken care of people that have had significant side effects from supplements. So in general, I feel comfortable um, with people's decisions to take supplements. I am a minimalist myself. I do not like to load up people on a whole host of different supplements, but there are some, and I had mentioned, you know, I think resveratrol is a very interesting supplement derived from from uh, grapes and, and wine. Um, I, 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 you know, what they've discovered about its mechanism of action is very, very interesting, and its potential impact on a number of systems is interesting. You know, but beyond that, things like green tea uh, can be very beneficial. Um, certainly, we know coffee is protective against the development of dementia. So would I have you take green tea extract? No. But would I have you drink green tea? Absolutely. And it seems that, um, I mean, some things um, should be relatively easy to do. For example, the green tea, you know, instead of Absolutely. drinking a soda in the afternoon, um, which is much more easy to find, um, you know, as you're running your errands or what have you, you just you just have to, I think the, the point is we, we have to have the mindset that you're prepared um, and you don't just, Leave it, um, leave it to okay. Well, I'm out and about, and oh boy, I need I need a pick me up or I need a snack. And right. Then we, you know, it's really difficult to find some good food or even a good you know drink that doesn't have sugar and doesn't have uh, um, high fructose corn syrup or inflammatory foods when you're out and about. But if you're prepared ahead of time and you bring it with you, you bring your water bottle or oh. you bring. You know, your tea or your nuts with you, then it's just sort of just creating that mindset that you're prepared for later. Right, that's right. Really that's such a great point. Um, we have um, a few more questions. Um, I want to make sure we get to um, to yet here, who um, who we talked to uh, a little earlier, and his question is. I'm 69 years old, and I don't remember what I just read or the spelling of words when I type. I, for, I forgot food on the stove. And then he says, um, does, okay, I don't know how to pronounce this drug, gaba, gabapentin, gaban, gabapentin, gabapentin, gabapentin yes, yes, contribute to this problem? And what exercises can I do to improve my memory? Right. So I don't know why this person is on gabapentin, uh, but the but the laundry list of potential side effects from gabapentin is quite long, and it can certainly include things like difficulty concentrating um, and and memory loss. So I would have that conversation with your doc. Uh, and see if there isn't a possible alternative if this is going on. And if, certainly if it wasn't there before, I'd be much more suspicious of gabapentin. Realize, too, that as we age, because of our, um, because of our liver's capacity to detoxify diminishes with age, we may need less dosage of medications. And frankly, the metabolism of medications is, is a very person-dependent thing. So, you know, I I would certainly try perhaps if there's no way to change the medication, um, perhaps lowering the dose. You know, it's my goal starting in a person's late 60s to begin to taper off medications as much as I can while still being cognizant of, you know, taking care of whatever conditions they're on them for initially. Just because I find, and especially if there's polypharmacy, if there's a number of medications that a person's on, any one could cause um, there to be a slowing of the metabolism of any other drug. So 
that's something to directly ask your doc about. In terms of ways to improve uh, your memory, I would say um, uh, learn how to dance <laughs> would be a big one. Learn another <laughs> language would be a big one. Learn an instrument. Those are some of my favorite because they affect us at so many different levels. They engage us at, me at several different levels. And certainly dance can be a socializing uh, activity, and I think all of us need as many connections as we can possibly handle. Um, and, you know, just to give a plug to the Alzheimer's Research and Prevention Foundation, one of the things that I teach when I lecture on, on memory in particular is the Curtin Kriya meditation that's listed on the website. Um, I, you know, because I feel strongly that people should have a meditation practice of some sort, if memory is your concern, then this is the meditation you want to begin with and, and, and see where it goes with you. It's simply 12 minutes a day. All of us can afford that. So um, there's data to support its efficacy in both improving mood and memory. So that I would direct you to the website and, and, and get the CD that teaches you exactly how to do the meditation and begin it, begin it right away. I was just, I was going to add that, so thank you for mentioning it. Yes, <laughs> yes, and that that was one of you know it's definitely one of the um, goals of the foundation is to teach people what to do and and how to take care of their own health and brain health and the four through the four pillars of Alzheimer's prevention, which is pretty much what we've been talking all along um, about all along tonight. So, um, all right, moving on to the next question. We have a little over about seven minutes left. Um, okay, we had two questions about uh, food sensitivity. Uh, one was, um, I was told that gluten sensitivity may actually be an allergy to contaminants in the bread. And if I ate home-baked bread or better bread, I wouldn't have it. Is this true? I guess that's the question. Dr. Koffler? Oh. I'm sorry. I missed the... Um, oh. uh, okay, so that's... Okay, that's the gluten sensitivity Activity. question. Okay. It may actually be an allergy to contaminants in the bread. Okay. No, that's not accurate. So... It's Okay, so we don't want to confuse two important words. One is sensitivity, and the second is allergy. In medicine, when we say we have an allergy, a true allergy to something, that is associated with a certain kind of immunologic reaction that is usually involves the mucous membranes of the mouth, the throat, the lungs, et cetera, um, and is... And is very powerful. People with allergies know what they're allergic to when it comes to food in general. Um, it's peanuts, it's shellfish, it's things like that. Sometimes it can be so bad that it can be life-threatening. Mm -hmm. I am not, I'm not talking about that and I, have, I don't think I've ever met anybody with an actual uh, IgE mediated wheat responsiveness, but I have met people with celiac disease which is an antibody to either the gluten or the gliadin proteins that are in wheat. Realize that gluten is a very complicated, large sort of gnarly mo molecule. And the wheat, the wheat um, in our country has been altered so that the gluten concentration has been increased. And there were some significant and, and uh, well-intentioned um, reasons for that to have happened. But the downstream effects of that has been that that protein in larger concentrations has become toxic to a greater number of people. And we include sensitivities, and this speaks to somebody else's question about gluten sensitivity um, and food sensitivities as a major cause of illness. In my experience, I am seeing a lot of people with wheat, sensi wheat sensitivities and other foods that I mentioned earlier, as well as, you know, wheat tests for 154 different foods. So it can be anything from cranberries to nutmeg to seafood. So 
Uh, it's different in every individual, but certainly a sensitivity is often more delayed. In other words, you don't eat that food and immediately feel symptoms. So some people might get a migraine or might get bloating during the course or after the course of that meal. Um, but it doesn't typically involve wheezing or inflammation of, of mucous membranes in the way that we see with an actual allergy. Uh, it's not, if you're calling the contaminants in bread this heightened or greater concentration of gluten, then I would say yes, it is a sensitivity to a greater concentration of a certain protein. Home-baked bread will not be any better unless you get it gluten-free if you indeed have a gluten sensitivity. So um, other breads that you can make include, and I'm, I am a horrible cook and a worse baker, but I have managed to make coconut bread, coconut flour, and oh. almond flour bread. And there's a lot of other... Um, there's a lot of other flours on the market now that people can make homemade bread with. And if that's the case, then they're perfectly safe. They they are not gluten-containing. Oh, fantastic. I never heard of that. Great information. Um, okay. Um, I guess, let's see. I think we have time for maybe one last question. And um, I guess we're leaving the best for last in a way. Um, what are your views on hormone replacement for women? Uh, and okay. is there a length of time to take them? Okay, so I'll try to make this brief, but this is, you know, a two-hour lecture that I often give. Yeah. So, yeah, <laughs> so hormones for women. Okay, so again, remember how I said that the healthiest societies in the world, what are they doing and what, you know, let's study them and try to imitate them. None of them are on hormone replacement therapy. I just want to make that clear. I do not think in order to age well in our culture, you have to be on hormones. Having said that, we live in a very fast-paced, demanding culture. And hormones can, and the loss of our hormones can have a very big impact on people. My experience is the more depleted a woman is as she goes into menopause, the worse she does and the more likely she's going to need hormones to sort of buffer that experience. Uh, the, the, the better condition she's in, in other words, the better self-care she's been manifesting leading up to menopause, typically those women do a lot better. That's been my own personal experience. Um, hormones have a very positive impact on brain health. There are estrogen receptors all over the brain. When women go through, go through menopause, there is a drop in brain volume. That's been documented. Um, there's an, you know, and many women will describe they feel like they're in a, a brain fog as they oh, go through yeah. menopause. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But oddly enough, you know, they emerge on the other side and they might still be pretty darn sharp. And I think it's interesting that the fastest growing sector of new business in America is in postmenopausal women. I read that not too long ago, so I like quoting that fact. Um, so, you know, it's something that we get through and we do just fine on the other side, but not everybody has that experience. And so for the appropriate women, uh, you know, and, and that's a risk-benefit assessment. In other words, I want to know what her risk is for breast, ovarian, or uterine cancer. I want to know what her bone health is like. I want to know exactly what we're treating. Is it... Is it joint pain? Is it mood? Is it brain health? Uh, is it bone health? Um, so my general view on hormone replacement for women is it has to be done thoughtfully and we have to have a clear-cut reason why we want to do that. Um, how long is someone on it? That's a very person-dependent thing. So it may be just to get them through a rough patch uh, emotionally. It may be because their bones are in real jeopardy, in which case they'll be on hormones longer. In general, I use bioidentical hormones. Uh, I, I, I don't prescribe um, pharmaceutical-based hormones that are not identical to what a woman makes. Um, and I will also use hormone replacement therapy for men, also being cautious, using the lowest doses I can in order to affect a clinical response. Well, um Thank you very much. It seems that the theme, um, to me, the takeaway theme of the call is it really we're all in, 
unique individuals, and it's not a one-size-fits-all. However, what you've mentioned about, you know, diet and some supplements and movement and spiritual fitness is sort of the guidelines, but um, but all the rest is really, it really depends on, who, you know, how we're feeling, who we are, our age, and what stage of life we're in, and, and so... Uh, we have to be more aware of ourselves and you know and have the right support system that makes it to help us make the right decisions that's such a great point Kirti. we've got to be aware of ourselves and our own personal needs because it is not a one size fits all so working with practitioners not just mds but other providers that can help you understand and make sense of what you're experiencing is a great way to go yes yes well, um, Dr. Koffler, thank you so very much. Um, we're at the end of the call. Um, we appreciate uh, your time and your expertise and sharing all this wonderful uh, wisdom with us. And um, is, if uh, I want to put a, a last plug into, in for the foundation. If anybody, you know, would like to support the foundation, and um, we will be very, very grateful and happily receive your contribution. You can do that online or you can call us. And all the details are at www.alzheimersprevention.org. And I wish everyone a very good evening. Thank you so much for staying up late um, to be with us for you folks on the East Coast. And uh, have a good evening. Thank you, Dr. Koffler. Thanks so much. It's my pleasure. Have a wonderful evening. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everybody.